How are you doing today, sir? Mate, I am great. Well, am I great? I mean, uh, let's be honest. I'm going to be honest. And I think I'm a little bit COVID weary today. I'm just a bit over it all. Because everything's I starting think- to be locked down again in London. And <clears throat> it, it's everything. So it's so fucking confusing the kind of method they've chosen to use in terms of tears of danger. That I, I, I don't know what the fuck's going on. You know what I mean? Sure. I think I'm just a little bit COVID weary today and a little bit, a kind of bit, a bit frightened maybe even. Do you know what I mean? Just a bit like, I don't know what to believe. It's... Well, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Here in, Lo- in Los Angeles, where I live, generally speaking, everywhere I go, I see people wearing masks and people yeah. here believe in science. And it is, um, it's, you know, I feel safe when I go to the supermarket. How is it in London in terms of people wearing masks? It feels exactly the same. Everyone, uh, there's a lot of masks. I mean, everyone has masks. I mean, there's lots of areas outside London now where it's the COVID's gone rampant like crazy again. And But people still meet up and have like a, a 5,000 person party and then wonder why like a thousand of them die or contract yeah. an awful disease. It, it's very, very frustrating. Let's yeah. switch subjects and get into more positive stuff because um, I think I think everyone watching this will be like, I've, I've heard enough about COVID. I got yeah, it. Yeah, agreed. We're all in the same boat. Um, so I got a bunch of things for you, but I'm going to start with, uh, um, I have a question from someone named a Simon Pegg. Oh, right. Yeah, um, I, you've probably heard of him. He said, because uh, I like working in things people hopefully don't know into interviews. He said, um, what do you remember about the wind chime on his window in the Kentish Town flat that you shared? So the wind, I mean, this goes with part of like the fact that I've been, there's been a lot of kind of supernatural occurrences in my life. And uh, the wind chime was something, he had like a, he had like a dream catcher and a wind chime. And one night when we shared a bed, well, we shared a futon, he, uh, it started to ring. It started just to ting, ting, ting. And it probably did that, you know, there was no wind. Uh, it probably did that for about five minutes. And we got so terrified that we just got under the, like under the covers. And uh, if like our feet went out, we started to scream like children. <laughs> <laughs> and we were convinced, you know, cause there, I'd lived in this house that he'd lived in too. And I was convinced that there was a woman, a spirit of a woman in the house. And so we, I think we thought that potentially she had come with us when we moved. Uh, a lot of people don't realize, uh, I believe you became friends with Simon when you worked at like a restaurant together or something, or how, how, how did you guys actually first meet? Yeah, his, he, I worked at a Mexican restaurant called Chiquitos and I was a bartender uh, when I was like 20, 22, maybe 21. And uh, this kind of cute Scottish girl came to work there and uh, we became friends, you know, we just kind of got each other straight away. And, uh, and then one night I said, hey, do you have like, do you have a boyfriend? And she said, yeah, you know, I've got this guy. I was like, fuck you, buddy. <laughs> and uh, and that, that guy turned out to be Simon. And, uh, you know, as soon as I saw him, I realized that uh, he was the real prize, not her, you know. <laughs> so you, made, I got it. So you did the switcheroo and switched from the girl to the guy. Yeah, there was like a weird three-way for like a year and a half where we just, like the three of us kind of loved each other. And like Charlotte and I would rush back from, from work on a Thursday night and Simon had kind of set up the front room already so we could rush in and like smoke a joint and then watch Northern Exposure go out. (laughs) Uh, We just loved it, man. We just lay about watching Northern Exposure and just laughing and uh, being idiots. It was, it was like a kind of threesome that you see in like uh, a French film or uh, Itu Mama Tambien, do you know what I mean? Without the bare naked legs or sex. Right, I was just gonna make a joke about the the sex, but I was, you know, anyway. Uh, But the interesting thing is, when you were growing up, were you even thinking about acting? Or was this something, how did this actually enter your life? Uh, yeah, I mean, honest to God, I never thought about what I'd do. I mean, I think there was a brief, there was like a day in 1986 when I thought I might join the Navy. Uh, 
And that, but that was it, man. I had no plan. I hated school. I was really bad at it. Um, I had like a troubled family. There was like a lot of alcoholism um, and trauma. And so I kind of just ran away when I was 17, 18. And I went and lived in, in Israel for two years. And that was like my university. And I, I came, you know, I fell in love and came back and followed a woman back. And started working in this restaurant. And I was, I was kind of happy with that, you know. I was, I was good. I was like a big fish in a little pond. I was the funniest guy there. And, um, you know, I was making good tips. And there were lots of nice waitresses and parties every night. And, you know, clubbing at weekends. And I was good. I never imagined that I'd have to think about doing something other than that, you know. And it was only when I met Simon and... He was a stand-up, and he said, maybe, you, why don't you try some stand-up? And uh, I, I did. I, you know, he wrote out this piece of paper in A4, giving me the names of comedy clubs and people I should bring. And so I ended up doing 12 gigs, and six were great, and six were fucking tragic and so painful, so painful, and all, just awful. <laughs> um, and it, so that wasn't for me. But he wrote, he, him and Jessica Hines um, then, were, you know, after about four or five years, six years of hanging out, he always said I was the funniest guy that he knew. And so when they got commissioned to write Space, he said, I'm going to write this character. Well, it was my character that I'd invented called Mike. And, um, and he put it in the show and kind of said, you're, you're doing it. You've got to do it. And so that was it, you know. But I was, a te I mean, I'm ter I mean... I hate it when actors say, well, I'm just terribly shy before like juggling on top of a piano in a nightclub, you know what I mean? But it's, you know, I suffered from anxiety and, and a fear of being looked at. And, you know, I've got a thing called hypervigilance disorder. So I kind of, I, I see threat everywhere, if you know what I mean, you know. So to suddenly then be an actor, you know, and have, hundred people on the crew looking at me and having to remember dialogue. And it, it was, it was a curse really. And there's, there's part of that that still remains today in terms of that anxiety and that fear, you know, it's, I think I've, I think it's been like, I've served an apprenticeship as being an actor and, and, and a filmmaker where I've just learned on the go and I've listened and I've watched and, I've done, I've made good choices, I think. And I've just, even now, every day at work, it's, I find something new or I'm watching people or, you know, I don't think I'll ever be finished. What's more challenging for you, uh, being on set, being looked at by everyone on the crew or going to like a Comic-Con and standing on a stage in front of like 5,000 people? Well, there's a part that switches on, you know what I mean? And I just start to, it's business, I'm a, it's business you know what I mean? Sure. I remember when my dad died, I had to fly to LA the next day to shoot, to do, to shoot pickups on Paul. And so that was that mode. I'm just clicking into this business mode now. And I'm Nick Frost, you know, I've done Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz and here I am at Comic-Con and I'll be funny and it's nice. And I, I love it. You know, I love Q and A's and I think I'm naturally funny. So it's not a chore for me, but being on set's kind of difficult too, because it's, I've never, I mean, a couple of couple of times, but I've never seen crew fuck up, really. I mean, you know, focus pullers have a difficult time. We're, we're pulling to different points, and but I've never seen crew fuck up, really. So for me to come on set underprepared and not know my dialogue or not know what's going on, that's a fear for me, you know, and that's that fear, I think, keeps me getting up at 6 a.m. every day to do three hours dialogue work and, and re reading my stuff overnight and reading every name on the call sheet. And, you know, that's what keeps that, that, that fear of fucking up in front of a crew is what drives me, I think. I, I completely get it. Can you look back on Spaced or do you just see, oh, man, like I was so young. I didn't know what I was. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, yeah, look, I've never, I mean, I've watched it a few times, but 
I know it means a lot of it means a lot to a lot of people, and I really respect that. And I love being Mike. And but I think a lot of the time I was just fucking frightened and nervous, and uh, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, just trying to <laughs> trying to get through the day. And you know, I I like I like it when people laugh. That makes me happy. You know, and so. <laughs> It was good when that happened. And also you get that kind of vibe. It's like, oh, I could I could do this. Maybe, you know, but after space, after the first season of space, I, I, I fucking, uh, I did my money in like five weeks or some ridiculous, I think I got paid shit, you know, but, but, but for a waiter who was getting essentially kind of $3 an hour or fucking $2.50 an hour to suddenly be given like, eight grand, it was like fucking Christmas for me. And I didn't realize what tax was. I didn't know, I thought the show would be out like, I thought, oh, the show will be out in like a month and then people will see me and then I'll get other jobs and I can, then I'll get paid and I'll never have to go back to the restaurant, you know? So I kind of did like all that money in like five weeks. Uh, and then I was like, <laughs> okay, so, so now what? And I had to go back to waitering, you know, even when Space was, even when the first season was on TV, I was waitering while that was on, you know. And it would be, it'd be weird that I'd get people asking for the bill and then saying, hey, are you Mike from Space? You know, it was a... <laughs> I just kind of thought that it would change immediately. My life would change and I'd be like, now I'm on television, you know. Listen, uh, Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, World's End, uh, the stuff that you did with Edgar and Simon, I mean, people love these movies. Yeah. When you, when you think back on the making of them, um, can you sort of like, can you share like what you remember about making those films? And, you know, at the time that you were making them, did you realize how special they would be in, ter in terms of how much people would love these? No, I don't think I think like that. You know, that's not for me to say, you know, it's just make the best thing you can. And uh, I, I think I remember feeling very included, you know, um, my voice was, was always heard. You know, I, my opinion was always valued and valid, you know, and I, I, I that's something that, you know, I think there are actors who work their whole life and they never... They just act and they never say anything or say, hey, can we try this? Or can I say this? Or, you know, I just, I think I've been very lucky in in that being my norm, you know, on set, on a set. And so I've taken that into everything I've done in terms of having a voice and and, and wanting to be heard and, and saying, hey, what what about this? You know, it's it's sometimes it's not right, but it's nice to to be able to do that. You know, I think I, I remembered falling in love with the crew, you know, and that life and seeing the passion of these fucking craftsmen who, you know, that film Hot Fuzz was my life, you know, that was my, that was my life working on that film. That was like a dream. And uh, it was it really hard. You know, Edgar was, Edgar gets, I think he was really stressed and tired and it was hard and, you know, he put so much into it that it's difficult sometimes to see someone you love suffer so much doing something which should be fucking great, you know. Um, but it's, you know, Simon and I are his foils and, you know, if, if by being a bit sad with us or being a bit cross with us because we're fucking about, it means he can give his all, you know, then I'm prepared to take that, if you know what I mean. Completely. Uh, I believe, and I'm going to say this name wrong, and I apologize, but have you been to Gloucestershire? How do you pronounce it? Gloucestershire? Gloucestershire, yeah. Okay. Have you been there since the movie has come out, and do you pay for anything? <clears throat> well, where we shot in Wells, Wells is actually in Somerset. So we shot in Somerset, which is where Edgar is from. But there's a really beautiful hotel in like a country house really nearby called Babington House. And that's like my favorite place to go because the food's great and they, you have little cabins in the woods and you can get a nice massage and stuff. But whenever I go there, I always drive my car through Wells. It's like a one-way system. 
And I always drive it round quite slowly about three times to see how many, how many waves I can... Because it's funny, because people were like, that's fucking... That's Danny Butterman in, in Sanford, you know. That has to be a thing. Like, obviously, you can't do it right now with COVID. But have, has it been that you've been... Uh, how Has it been that you've been out at a bar or, you know, restaurant and people, you know, they, they feel that they have to pay for a drink or they want to get... You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, a lot. Uh, yeah, over the last kind of 15 years or so, there's there's a lot of people who want to, you know, I'll be at a pub, not, I haven't, you know, drank for like three years, but I'll be in a in a pub and someone will bring a drink over or so. I just wanted to say thanks. Or I think people feel like those films were made specifically for them. Sure. You know, also we got, when we did like the Hot Fuzz press tour in the States and, and the Shaun of the Dead press tour and then, Maybe on World's End too, but like people would bring us a ton of fucking space cakes and like cake were weed in and, you know, we were kind of puffers, but I think people think they see you as these characters and then it's like, this guy's going to get pot hash brownies, you know, pot cookies. You know, I've, I've heard that from other people too. Um, listen, I have to ask you, uh, I obviously love the work that you guys did together, Simon and Edgar and you. Um, and I've, I've brought it up with Edgar and Simon many times, and I'll bring it up with you, of course. Do you think that there's another movie or another project on the horizon with you guys working together? Um, I, God, I'd like to think so. I mean, I think there's something about the three of us being friends and making films. What was that film that you made it over the course of 12 years? Uh, Link, was it Linklater? Oh, you're talking about Boyhood? Boyhood, you know. There's, a, there's something boyhood about our characters and the fact that in Sean we were, you know, in World's End we were 15 years older than we were in Sean. And I kind of love the fact that as we get older, we evolve as actors and the characters we play evolve. And, you know, Edgar's skill level evolves and, uh, and what he does evolves. And I think it would be a real shame to not see us again in five years and, and to see who we are then, you know, who we can play then. You obviously got to work with Spielberg on Tintin. Um, I'm a little disappointed that there was never a sequel to that. Uh, were you? No. <laughs> that was that. Uh, that again, you know, in terms of being um, stressed on a set, you know, going from doing Sean and hanging out in London with my mates and doing comedy and uh, doing comedy with Edgar and Simon and. And then you get kind of cast as the Thompson twins. And we're suddenly now in Santa Monica in a kind of dance center, learning to move like Thompson and Thompson. And it was, you know, Peter Jackson would rewrite the script every night. And so we didn't know what we were shooting. So we'd come in in the day and you'd be given four pages of dialogue. And it's like, we're shooting this in 30 minutes. It was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? You know. Feet don't fail me now. You know, it was uh, it was a lot of pressure and you couldn't have, you know, it, that's the thing about me and my fear is I'm always all right afterwards. And I always say to my girlfriend, my partner, uh, it was all right. I did it. I did it. I was fine, you know. Um, but at the time, it's like, I'm never going to do this. And my fucking my pants are going to blow up and my fucking cock is going to come out and Steven's going to see it. And then Kathy Kennedy, I'm going to be sick on Kathy Kennedy. And, you know, I'm going to knock Peter Jackson off his big monitor on the wall. And, and I'm not going to learn my lines. Just, just, just fear, you know, just fear. And I was just, I, you couldn't have picked worse people to fuck your career in front of, should that have been the case, you know? I can't imagine. I really love the film. I really love the film. I mean, me yeah. and my partner and my, my kid watched it a couple of months ago. I was like, oh, this is fucking great. It's, it's great. Yeah, no, it, I completely. Um, I have not heard much on this project, so I apologize if you didn't do it or if it fell apart, but like, were you a part of this, The Nevers, with Joss Whedon? Yeah, yeah. I just finished my stuff like a month ago. We started shooting in October 2019. Uh, and then I did like a, a week on it. Um, and then uh, that was kind of my stuff done. And then in January, 
we started to get a sniff of lockdown and then they just shut down. So I didn't do anything for a year. Um, and so I picked up my scenes like a month ago and, and, and finished the season. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it, it looks fucking crazy. It looks amazing. Um, I think the script is fantastic. My character's like a serial lunatic. Um, and it's just, Joss, Joss is amazing because he's like as a person, not as a director, he's really, um, he's really giving and generous, you know, of spirit and of time. Um, but when he's on set, he's, he's so kind of driven and focused and mumbly. And a lot of the time it's like, oh my God, I don't know. What do you, I'm not sure what you want, especially when you've got a face mask on as well. And uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of amazing way to work. But I, I just, I love it. I love the character. And I think people are going to just fucking love it. It's complicated and it's, it's fresh. So it's a series. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, uh, I don't, I mean, don't want to, I don't know um, how HBO are going to drop it, but it, it's, I think COVID might have split a, a big season of 10 into two of five, but I, that's, that literally changes all the time. So I don't know. How would you compare this series to what Joss has done before? Well, I mean, uh, apart from the fact there's a supernatural element, it just feels totally different. You know, it's, it's, I mean, even me with a broad kind of lexicon of knowledge of, of, of the supernatural and, and the genre, I'm reading the scripts thinking, fucking hell, this is going to be incredible, you know. Did he direct all the episodes? Yeah, he directed all my episodes, and I, th I think he directed them all. Got it. Um, I, I have a million other questions, but we'll talk about it when it uh, premieres. Yeah, you know, cool. We'll, we'll come back to it. So jumping into why I get to actually talk to you today, I just want to let you know I had a lot of other questions about other things, but I've just cut them all down because of, you know, the time limit. Um, uh, so something for the future. But um, so Truth Seekers is why I get to talk to you. I watched the whole series. Hey. Yeah, no, um, I really, really dug it. And it's fast moving. And the best term I can use for it is fun. It's just a fun, oh, okay. it's a fun yeah. ride. So yeah. uh, talk a little bit about where this idea came from. And um, uh, let's just start with the basics. Uh, well, look, I've always said about that. I've always loved the supernatural and ghosts and being being afraid and fucking horror films and you know and me and James who came up with the idea for the show had this idea for this character Gus you know broadband engineer grumpy uh, had a past uh, you know full of tra uh, trauma and and grief and you know has his own YouTube channel and, and tries to debunk or prove you know, uh, supernatural occurrences that drop onto his desk. But I think in, as a group, you know, we'd always be sending each other weird, fucked up YouTube clips or little memes of, here's a poltergeist in Dublin, or, you know, people being exercised in, in Chile or, or like Italy, or little aliens kind of scuttling across the road and we'd send little things like, hey, was that fucking real? Do you know, could that be real? Just like we're that kind of gang and it just became aware, we became aware of the fact that there was a lot in that as in terms of a character and, and building a show around that, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think that's where we started. So the series is eight episodes. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about, was it always designed as eight episodes? Were you... Was it ever going to be six or ten? How how did you guys come up with that number? I think we I think we just maybe it would have been six at the beginning, but I think it was that kind of thing during meetings with Amazon where you start chancing your arm in terms of hey we could do eight times one hour or you know give us the money for twenty times four minutes you know just weird time slots and so yeah we just said yeah let's just go let's get eight you know eight seemed right for us there was a chance we could have had ten at one point too but. Eight seemed a perfect kind of way to build a nice arc in and everyone to have something to do and, and, uh, and, and there'd be enough room there for characters to be built, you know. Sure, when you go to a meeting like that with Amazon, obviously 
everyone's looking for something that can be, you know, more than one season. How yeah. much are they asking in the room at that, on those meetings? Um, okay, what's your plan for five years? What's your plan for three years? Or are you yeah. just envisioning this as a one season thing? There's three seasons there. If we, if, 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 you know, if, if they want more than one season, I think we've definitely planned for three. Um, after that, I'm not sure, you know, I think it becomes a balancing act between keeping a good monster of the week and then keeping a good arc and it not be like, I don't know, I used to fucking love that show Fringe. Oh, I love uh, Fringe, please, love. But it, it, Fringe got to a point where I was like, nah, I don't care anymore, you know. Same with X-Files, it went on, to, uh, I was like, oh, I'm not bothered anymore, you know. And I, I wouldn't want that to be the case, you know. If, if, if it's three and done, that feels like a nice a nice chunk of storytelling, you know? Well, I think, that, I mean, uh, I think just to not get off on a tangent, but I think one of the problems with a Fringe or with an X-Files is that um, the creators are never sure when it's going to end. Yeah. And when they started, those shows existed in a time where you weren't pitching the network on like seven years. It was like, let's just do one year and see what happens. Yeah. You know? I mean, look, you have a three-year idea for Truth Seekers. So... Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I think with True Seekers too, it's about keeping it. I like the fact it's set in Britain and it's kind of naff and, and parochial, and I'd like to keep that, you know, but also expand it in terms of where we go. You know, that's the that's the balancing act, I think. One of the things that I really enjoyed was having Malcolm on the show, um, yeah. and uh, the way he's introduced in the first episode is great. Um, uh, talk a little bit about getting to work with him because, I mean, he's Malcolm. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I was slightly nervous um, in terms of what he's done and his output. And, you know, I didn't want him to come down on set and be mad and be a, like a, a loony and be aggressive. And, <laughs> uh, you know, you have expectations of what people are going to be like. I mean... I do, but he was like, we spoke to him on the phone and he was just like, he's game, you know what I mean? He's like, he's vivacious and he came on set and he knew his shit and he was funny and he has a great line in anecdotes and, you know, he's just, when it was just him and me in my house and we sat around that table and we just did our scenes there and, there was a real stillness to them, which I really loved, you know, and it was always me trying to make him laugh if I could. And, but he's just up for it, you know, he's just, he's not, despite how old Malcolm is, I'm not sure how old he is, but he's well into his fifties. Uh, yeah. uh, he, you know, he was fucking virile and, and, and up for it. You know, he'd come on set and say, Hey, how about we try this or how about this line? And you know, we'd give it, we'd always try it. It was always great, you know, it's always just clever and just just a man who knows his shit, you know, knows his trade and his craft. What I liked about the show is that every episode, it's obviously like um every episode ties together, you know, it's one big story. Um yeah. talk a little bit about in the creation, obviously, you have a certain amount of money to make the show, a certain amount of time, budget, schedule. What was it like when you guys were writing it in terms of like knowing how much money and time you were gonna have? How did you sort of find that line between what can we write that we can actually pull off with the resources that we have? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that, that's a really good question because it's, we, re, we overwrote the shit out of the show, essentially. You know, we didn't have, we never had a clear ending. We had lots of great ideas, lots of great episodes, but each episode was coming in at like 44 pages because we thought they were going to be hour long episodes. And so we just wrote really long. They were really complicated, overly ambitious, and we didn't have a clear idea of what the ending was. And so we got to a point like, fucking six months in where me and Nat and James were just sat at a table probably for a week just thinking well now what we don't know what the end how do we get the end 
we do this, that doesn't work. If we do this, that, you know, and then someone had the great idea of let's the kill your babies thing. Let's remove a fucking whole big strand that we never thought we'd ever remove from the script. Let's just get rid of it completely. And our ending is this. And now let's work toward that, you know. And that worked. That really worked. We really got us going again. Um, but then the problem we had is, you know, once then you say, okay, we'll commission eight by 30 minutes and the budget's this and, you know, things that you thought would have to be in now can't be in, you know, it was a real, it was a real learning curve for me, you know, too, to in, in, as a producer to, to have to say, okay, well, we can't do this. We can't afford to do this. And now the scripts, which were 44 pages long, they now have to be 25 pages long. So we need to get rid of half of everything. <laughs> what was his name in Avengers? Thanos? Yeah. It was like editing with Thanos. Uh, so, that, I mean, that was a real skill for all of us, you know, to have to then say, okay, so let's lose this and this, but let's keep the characters and we'll keep foibles and little fun things and keep it fresh and moving. And it, it was... It was fucking difficult it was difficult um i think we all quit the job a few times you know we'd all walk out uh and then like we'd be given the day off and then even though as a producer i at one point fucking quit uh it was it was tough you know but it's it's did, did you rage quit and just you know do Mom, something I'm done i'm done i'm not coming in <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but that was cool, you know, that was fine. But then you get someone like Jim Field Smith, the director came in and said, okay, well, this is what we can do. This is our budget for FX and this is how we're going to do it. And, and, you know, it really, Jim's knowledge and his skill really took a load off us in terms of coming in and kind of save, saving it really, you know. Sure. I, I wanted to talk about his work, but I want to now jump backwards and say what you ended up cutting um, is it stuff that you could see going in the second and third season? Or? Absolutely, yeah. It's a really, it's a, this will, this will be what we reveal in season two as, as, as running shit, you know. Have you, obviously Amazon is airing it on October 30th. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that the executives there have watched the series. Uh, what's been their feedback so far? Uh, Amazon, from the get-go, from the meetings we had initially, in the UK and then hearing that, you know, Amazon worldwide want to put it on worldwide, not just in the UK. And they've, they've been nothing but supportive. Um, their notes have been fucking great um, and minimal, you know, it's just been a really nice experience through something which was kind of difficult to write. And then, you know, it was a hard shoot and, they've been great you know even through this covid stuff we were we were late delivering the show and they've just been incredibly patient with us um you have a lot of technical jargon that you have to deliver on this series uh talk a little bit about trying to learn all that dialogue and uh were you a little mad at yourself for writing it for yourself oh my god i i said in like three three separate times as we were writing the script Hey, I'd like Gus to say less. <laughs> I said, you know, why don't we just keep him as someone who doesn't say much? And, you know, he's got a few pearls of wisdom, but let's just keep it down the amount of stuff Gus has to say. But it just, but it went by the wayside. And, uh, it, you know, I always think I'm really bad at learning lines, but my, my brain just switches on and you suddenly then become capable of just learning the three pace scene in fucking 30 minutes, you know? Yeah, no, I, I don't know. I could never do it. You can. I bet you, any brain can. No, I'll bet you my brain can't. But let's oh. let's let's uh, you know. Um, uh, what is the plan though in terms of for you? Because we're almost out of time. Um, yeah. What's your plan for the future in terms of what's coming up? Uh, well, I uh, well the Nevers obviously that comes out next year. Um, touch touch wood, COVID wood, and then I leave for Los Angeles on Saturday next Saturday the twenty fourth. Um, and I am going to be there until April um, 
shooting a show, which I can't tell you what it is, um, but it's very exciting. And um, I'm a bit nervous because it's a big thing and uh, it's going to be a surprise. Uh, so I'm going to be in LA for the next five months. Well, first of all, now I'm very curious what this show is. Um, is it the kind of thing that I'm going to be very mad at myself when they announce that you're a part of it, that I didn't ask you about it? No, I think you're going to probably say, why is he doing that? Really? Uh, but yeah, but just it's just a, it's a kind of weird one for me to do. But the character was fantastic. I'm very curious. And hopefully there will be some sort of vaccine uh, while you're in L.A. so we can get a burrito. Yeah, listen, when uh, once we finish here, I'll text you what it is so you can know what <laughs> Right. Hey, listen, um, uh, I have a lot of other things we could talk about, but I wanted to make sure you're on time for what you need to do in two minutes. So I, I tried to be respectful of the, uh, of the, of the thing, but uh, needless to say, uh, congrats on truth seekers and, um, and everything else. And uh, you know, for the next one, I will uh, save all the other questions that I did not ask you. Uh, amazing. Let's hook up and have coffee when I get into LA. We could do a socially distant thing. Yeah, fine. I'll just wave at you. You be in one Starbucks and I'll be in another one and we'll... Exactly. Hey, listen, nice to see you, man. Thanks, mate. Cheers, Steve.